Hi guys, it's Ms. Haskell again. Here we are, second um, video screencast of uh, 18th century number two. And we are gonna start off um, this, this video recording looking at this amazing building. And I don't know, I don't know if any of you guys have been here before, but this is, not that one, this is Monticello. Uh, Monticello was the home of uh, the second president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, and he was also the designer of this home, um, which is pretty cool. However, so this is the piece that's on the AP, AP. this is the piece we're going to study, but this piece has a pretty long history. So let's go back and take a look at some of the history of this piece. All right, so this is the, um, this is the, uh, uh, this is the one I had before. Sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit. And this was the piece that uh, that influenced um, Thomas Jefferson, although he would never admit it. However, we can't start our journey right here. I'm going to go back a little bit further to here. Now, I can't remember if I showed you this piece. I don't think I did. Um, but this is the, um, the Villa Rotunda, or the Villa Rotunda. Um, and it was built during the Renaissance um, by a Renaissance, Italian Renaissance art, artist named Palladio. And Palladio, who was, a, was in a, a very, very much into the neoclassical style that happened during the Renaissance, uh, was, was really into uh, combining the elements, uh, uh, all the elements of classical style into this one building, which he designed as a grand home, personal home. And, and as you can see, it's got all kinds of classical elements that you're that you're used to seeing. It's got the the, the porticos. I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to actually go to the next slide and show you the floor plan. As you can see, it's a perfectly symmetrical house. It's amazing. Um, and in the very middle of it, it's got it's got um, it's got stairway entryways uh, into the building uh, on all four sides, exactly symmetrical. And in the middle, of course, is this great. Um, this great dome, the central open area. And then it's surrounded by rooms uh, all around the dome, that central dome. Um, so it's got the dome, which is a Roman, classical Roman thing. It's got, uh, it's got these, the temple style uh, porticos, all ionic um, with, every, with every element of that, including the pediments. Um, you can see the pediments are repeated over and over on the windows as well. You can also see that it, the portico, uh, temple style porticos are also um, ionic. Did I already say that? And that there are sculptures on top of them, which is a little bit unusual. That would have been more the Renaissance style uh, of, of um, classical. So Palladio was an interesting guy. He lived in the Renaissance, who was in the 1500s, and he wrote um, four books about architecture, uh, which were, uh, they were treatise, treatises on, uh, on classical architecture uh, and this neoclassical style that was the new revival of the classical style back in the Renaissance. Um, and these became kind of um, the Bible of a lot of architects who were living in the, in the 18th century, the eight, in, the, in the late 1700s. And of course, one of the top fans of Palladio was Thomas Jefferson, and he read all four of his books. Now, so that was one of Th Thomas Jefferson's um, inspirations, but this one, uh, this building was also one of his inspirations. Now, he would be loath to admit this because you guys might remember Thomas Jefferson um, was a real Francophile. He loved everything French, um, and he really hated the British. And that's understandable because they'd just gotten out of the war with the British, um, the U.S. had, uh, where they won the Revolutionary War. <laughs> but this, this house is British, so he would never have admitted to anybody that he thought this house was pretty cool. But this house, which is designed by Lord Burlington, uh, uh, who was, whose name was Richard Boyle, and this house is called the Ch Chiswick House, um, was also designed after, um, after Palladio's house. 
And, um, and it, as you can see, it has a lot of those same elements. It's a little bit smaller than Palladio's really grand, um, grand house. Uh, it's a little bit smaller. You can see that it's got a Corinthian style rather than the uh, Ionic style. And you can also see that there aren't entrances on all four sides. Um, you can see that it's not quite as tall. It doesn't have the two stories, um, but it does have a lower story, which is uh, actually um, covered a little bit by the podium or the stairways that lead up in a zigzag up the podium. So um, this house, uh, this house was definitely an inspiration um, to 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 uh, Jefferson, along with um, the symmetry. And even though it wasn't a completely symmetrical um, house, it had bilateral symmetry. It had um, temple-shaped porticos. Um, it only had two entrances. It also had balustrades, which you guys will remember are these kind of railings um, that we saw also in the neoclassical, the Renaissance style. Um, it has the stairs that zigzag up and lead the eye up into the center. Um, but the overall effect of this house, like Palladio's house, was very simple, very harmonious, and uh, a unique putting together of the elements of Renaissance classical style. But this one, like Jefferson's house, was built in the 1700s. It was built in 1724 um, to 1729. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, Monticello. Uh, this was built um, for 40 years later by Jefferson in 1768 to 1809. It was made from brick, glass, stone, and wood. Um, and let's, let's just kind of go back and make sure you understand who jo Thomas Jefferson is. Of course, he was the author of the Declaration of Independence. I'm sorry, I said he was the second president. He was the third president of the United States. He was the Secretary of State. He was the governor of Virginia. And he was this amateur architect. He had no formal training except for what he was able to observe and read. Jefferson believed that art and architecture could influence people for the better. And this is one of the reasons he clung on to this neoclassical style, which kind of takes me to um, the question. And I'll maybe I'll pop forward so you can get a preview of the question, which is why did Jefferson choose a neoclassical style? What was his message? And yes, he believed that that classical thinking could make people better, um, but he but he, but I want you to think about what ways, why, why would this new government and this new president of this new place decide to use, um, choose classical style? And if, if, and I'm sure most of you have been to the uh, U.S. Capitol uh, in Washington, D.C., like for the sophomore trip, uh, and you've noticed that there's a lot of classical style buildings, and there's a reason for that. Um, so I want you to think about that, and, uh, and I want you to um, answer that question. Um, the name Monticello meant little mountain, and he did build this house high up on the top of a, a top of a hill. Um, he wanted it to look very simple, um, but he did. It is in fact um, a two-story building, uh, and it's hard to tell that. What did he do in his design to disguise the fact that it was a two-story building? Can you see where the second story is? So as you can see, it's not a super grand building. You can see some people here that tell you the scale is livable. It's not a huge mansion. But if you've guessed that the second story is up here, you're correct. And this balustrade that runs right across the top of the, of the entablature here um, kind of hides the second story, which is, which is up, up here, which is, which is kind of interesting. Um, the facade has the has actually i'm asking you to tell me the the different um the different did i ask you that let me look all right come through no i didn't ask that so let's go back we'll, we'll talk about that so the elements of classical style obviously the the temple the temple styled um, portico um, with the Doric you know you can even see the triglyphs and the metopes all the way along the the entablature and the Doric columns um, you can see the balustrade which is um, which is a neoclassical um, Renaissance piece you can see the dome of course you can see uh, um, pedimental style toppings on the door and some arches as well. But there's also some elements to it that 
aren't tr traditionally classical. And, and some of it, it ref reflects its, the roots of it being an American building, a truly American building. So um, I want you to stop and let me know what you think is, is really super American about this. And while you stop and do this, I'm gonna keep going. And I want to take a, just show you some other pictures. This is Jefferson. Here's the question. Here's the here's the um, here's the uh, layout. Here's the floor plan for uh, Monticello. And as you can see, it's got uh, it's it isn't perfectly symmetrical like either the Chiswick House and definitely not um, Palladio's uh, Grand House. Um, but it's roughly symmetrical. The thing that makes it not symmetrical, more or less, is the the fact that the entryways are um, are are different from each other. There's and but both of them have have stairways that lead you up to the um, up to the podium of the house. And then here's a, a couple more shots of the house as it is set on its property. Which I'm going to go back here. Yeah. Oh, this is the plan of the Chiswick House. Aha! No wonder this didn't look right. Okay, so that's the Chiswick House. This is Monticello. This is Monticello. And this is Monticello. So the the southwest pad port, portico. That this is the um, this is the dome right here. On this. So early democracy. Think about why why the classical style. Why would Jefferson have chosen it? Here's the interior of the building and this. I'm gonna show you this one too really quickly. And this is um, the uh, Virginia State Capitol building, which is now has been destroyed by um, fire. Uh, but this was also designed by Jefferson. And as you can see, um, he, was, he very much liked this, uh, the neoclassical style. Okay. We're gonna scoot past a couple of other pieces. This is um, the Pantheon, which was a, a building in France in this time. And this is a British garden. And actually um, gardens became um, a, a big piece of art, a big way of, of showing um, people's, people's style, especially people of money. Okay, we're gonna pause here and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this painting. Uh, this painting is uh, called The Oath of the Horatii. It was created by um, Thomas Jefferson. Sorry, it was created by Jacques-Louis David. So we're, we're in France now, <laughs> my bad. All right, it was made in 1784. So we've actually gone scooting 20 more years down through the century. This, this century doesn't have a ton of art that we're gonna be looking at. Um, and this is uh, this is how in France. Remember that the the the, the French Revolution, which happened um, right at the turn of the last century, um, was the absolute death knell of the Rococo period. Um, artists returned to a much more serious style, um, which looked towards classicism for its model. Um, and and it, it is interesting to know to note how how this is often the way it is that art gets extremely uh, fancy and then it gets it gets simpler it goes back to like going back to its root, roots of um, simplicity. David did work for the King of France, um, and he was he was kind of a, um, a, t a prodigy. He was he still strongly identified, however, as the artist of the French Revolution. He was trained in the classical way, and in 1781, at the age of 33, uh, he re received great critical cri critical acclaim acclaim for an earlier painting that he had exhibited at the Paris Salon that I had mentioned to you last time. Um, then, in 1785 he painted this very large painting. It is actually 14 feet by 10, over 10 feet tall. It's very big. Um, it's called the Orth, or Oath of the Horatii. And he painted that for, in 18, 1785, four years before the French Revolution, which is interesting. He painted it in Rome so that he could be close to the source of his inspiration. So now let's take a look at the content for a minute. In this painting, there are the three brothers, the Horatii, who are, are swearing to fight to the death for their city. 
which is Rome, to their father. So you can see the Hor Horatii there on the left, all and, and their father holding their own swords up to them, and they're pledging, uh, they're, they're pledging allegiance to um, to Rome in this very very romantic way. And then on the other side of the painting, are there are there other families? This would be their sisters and their wives and their children. And they're not they're not they're not only the wives of the Horatii. Um, that, but they are also the sisters of wives of the heroes from Alba, um, as all of these families were in, intermingled through marriage. And so therefore, the women have great conflict. Either their husbands die or their brothers die, which is, um, which is kind of the, the problem here. They're all fighting, infighting with each other. Um, and so, so the content here is is this idea that there there is it wants the video the sorry the um, the viewer to have compassion for both sides. Yes, we want to root for the for the Horatii, but we also feel bad for these guys because either way they lose they lose their brothers or they lose their husbands. The eventual result is that one a brother of the of the three prevails, but in the end he kills his own sister because she mourns the loss of her husband from the other side. So it's a tragedy. And this is, you know, this is an illustration of a, of a, Roman, um, of a Roman tragedy. But this is not about the Roman tragedy. Dave, David wasn't painting about a historical painting about the, a tragedy that happened in ancient Rome. Oh no, <laughs> he, was, he was using this painting as an allegory or a moral tale for what was going on in France right then and there. So I want you to think about that. How did this parallel what was going on in France? And what does it tell you about what, where David's uh, loyalties lied, where his loyalties lay? Who did he, who did he think should win? Who did he, who did he feel should prevail? And is there, was there ever gonna be a situation where, where all could win or would everybody lose. So remember, he's painting for the king. And so was this a painting loyal to the king? That's the question. Okay, so now that I've sent you the question and I want you to think about that and record it in, in VoiceThread, uh, I want you to, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, about the layout of it. Of course, the, the content is very classical and that's why I took out the, that as, a, as a one of the classical things you could notice. But I want you to think about everything. I want you to think about the way that people are depicted in the setting and the painting style. What's the painting style like? And is one painting style more classical than another painting style? And, that, and how and why? So I want you to think. I want you to think about uh, about all of that. And how about the way that the people are shown? Or in what way are they classical? So I want. I definitely want you to think about um, about all of this and and write this down in VoiceThread. Were the colors that he used classical? What's classical about them? Yeah. So there's a lot to think about. Maybe we'll talk about this one more in class. Another very famous painting um, by, oh, here it is. This is, um, I'm sorry, I took a picture of this. It's very crowded in front of it. This is a picture that I took of it in front of the Louvre, so you can see how big it is. And here are the sisters. Oh, and the brothers. And your question. Okay. I'm going to pause here at um, this painting also by, um, by David. So after the French Revolution, in which you know um, the royalty lost and off with their heads, um, the, uh, the political group, the Jacobins, took power. And um, they took power in France. And David was, uh, David was the minister for propaganda for that party, for the Jacobin party. Um, and they commissioned the portrait of one of their leaders, whose name was Marat, M-A-R-A-T, who had been murdered in his tub a few years earlier. So it's actually not an idealized image of Marat, but it's actually a picture of him 
after he was murdered. So it was, it was after he had kind of sacrificed himself. It's interesting that he's sitting in, in his tub like this and, and working like on a makeshift desk. Um, and I guess, I guess apparently um, he had to take medicinal baths for a skin disease. Um, and, but he's young and healthy. He's shown as very young and healthy and ideal, although all dead. And you can see how because he's, there's, a, there's a knife wound uh, in his chest. Um, and uh, I want you to think about the style here. Yes, it's classical in some ways, but do you see quite a lot of tenebrism? And maybe does Marat remind you a little bit of um, Christ after he's come down from the cross, maybe like a Pieta? Yeah, he's trying to help us think, um, think of all, all of those things. Okay, so I'm gonna end this recording here. This is part one. And I'll do uh, I'll do the part two. I'll do part two. I'll do um, the last uh, couple pieces in uh, in this this class's um, lecture. And I'm going to stop this.